Hello, I'm Bob Massey, and I am the co-host of Creating the World We Want, a video podcast that helps us look into the future and figure out how we can build the world that we all believe we deserve. I'm here with my co-host, Tom Dodge, and very happy today to have our guest as Seti Warren, a very dear friend of mine. Um, despite the fact that you and I have run twice against each other <laughs> in various up, but uh, Seti has an extraordinary career. He was born and raised in Newton, and um, I learned four times president of his uh, class in uh, Newton High School. Uh, went on to um, attend uh, Boston College and then has gone on to many forms of public service, really his entire career. Uh, he served in the Clinton White House. He was the New England director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, he then went and worked with John Kerry as trip director and uh, political director in his uh, Massachusetts state office. And then was elected uh, mayor of Newton for eight uh, special years. So we look forward to talking about that. And today we're going to hear not only about what SETI is doing now, but also his thoughts about how we can create the world we want. So welcome, SETI. We're delighted to have you. It is great to be here. I'm glad I'm not running against you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Take note of that. <laughs> awesome, SETI. Well, just to start off kind of with your youth, you know, could you dive into a little bit of your childhood and really just touch on the values that created the person you are today? Absolutely. You know, I was fortunate to be born and raised in Newton, Massachusetts. Mm. Um, my family did not grow up with a lot of wealth. Uh, they grew up in New York. Uh, Dad grew up in Harlem. Mom grew up in the Bronx. Um, I always, uh, and Bob, you'll appreciate this because you heard me talk about this quite a bit, was appreciative of where my family came from. Mm -hmm. Two tough neighborhoods. Um, got out of that life through education, military service. Both my parents served, or, or rather, uh, were part of the civil rights movement. Uh, my dad, in particular, um, marched, did sit-ins, went to jail twice. Uh, so the household I grew up in was very much dedicated uh, to social justice, serving others. Um, my sister and I uh, were surrounded by that. Um, and infused with that. Um, and my parents were among a small percentage of African Americans that moved to Newton in 19, 1972. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a unique uh, moment for them and certainly uh, for me growing up in, in that environment and in, in our household and, and really facing a, a city that didn't have a lot of people that look like us. Well, you know, Seti, I have to say, traveling around the state, I heard from so many people about your father, particularly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I felt I was running against two Warrens because, <laughs> uh, because they had so much respect for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe he also uh, worked with Governor Dukakis and, and was, uh, was a real leader. Uh, is it true that you were crawling around uh, Mike Dukakis's uh, office when he was governor. That is true. Is true. I'm embarrassed to say. Yeah. But we, we, we make sure people know I was five years Eight. old. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a, it was not, you know, when I was an adult. <laughs> but that is true. My dad was yeah. assistant secretary of education for Michael Dukakis. Ah, yeah. And one of the things he was charged with was the successful or the attempt to successfully desegregate Boston schools. Mm -hmm. um, I remember him in talking the 70s? about that. Yeah, in the and, 70s. Oh I remember him talking about that, going into some pretty tough mm -hmm. neighborhoods. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, that was the era I was growing up in. This is, mm -hmm. you know, during the Boston desegregation. Mm. I'll never forget, I shared this story. Um, when I was second grade, my parents, uh, my, uh, the elementary school were taking kids to Bunker Hill mm -hmm. for a field trip. My parents said, you can't go. You cannot go because we don't think you're going to be safe because you're black and because... You know, and that was one of the first times I... And Bunker Hill's in Charlestown? Charlestown, yeah. Yeah, right. And there had been... I live right uh, there. There had been, you know, a lot of incidents where mm -hmm. people were throwing rocks and things like that. But that was one of the first times that mm -hmm. I... How old were you? First time, six or seven years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Is there anything else uh, from growing up? You, you, you uh, were finishing your description by saying that you had... Uh, your parents had uh, made this move to Newton, and then it, you, there were not many African-American families. What, what was that like? One of the things, uh, I'll never forget, it must have been when I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. My father shared, my parents shared this story with me. First year they moved to Newton, my mother took me and my twin sister for a walk in the stroller, mm -hmm. two years old. 
go down near the local high school, which where we live is very close to New York. Teenagers started throwing rocks, bottles at her, oh. almost hit her. Mm -hmm. Racial epithets going. Mm -hmm. Mom goes rushing back home, calls my father, who was working at Brandeis, and told him what happened. He went ballistic. He called everyone in the city he could, uh, police department, he was calling everywhere. Finally, he gets to the mayor's office, mm -hmm. and he says, I want to talk to the mayor, and I want him to understand what happened in the city. They put my dad through the mayor. My dad, Mayor Ted Mann at the time, didn't know who mm -hmm. he was. My dad was furious, just use some epithets as he describes to me, which I will not use on your show. Yeah. Um, and, and the mayor said to him, Joe, my father's name was Joe, mm -hmm. this is terrible, we will investigate it. Furthermore, I want you to help me make Newton a better place for mm -hmm. African Americans. Mm -hmm. And therein started this lifelong friendship and public participation in the city of Newton with my father and this mayor. That really, planted some seeds with me okay. about what you do when you deal with such a systemic issue like mm -hmm. race. How do you not just personally navigate it, but what your responsibility is to push back against it, make environment better. That was one of the earlier stories in my life that really planted the seeds for public service for me. Did that lead into you seeking the responsibility of leader of your high school as well? It did. You know, it, a couple of years later, I get to Newton North, and, um, you know, this sort of seed that my father planted with me about my responsibility of living in Newton, me and my sisters, and taking advantage of this wonderful community. And I say, You're, you have a responsibility to, to do something mm -hmm. in your community and not just watch. And um, when I got to high school, I thought, why not? You know, I mean, you know, why not? And Newton, you know, at the time, it still is 3% black. Um, a lot of kids didn't view me as someone that you'd naturally see as the class president. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I figured, you know, let me just go directly to the kids and make my case. And um, four years later, <laughs> I was <laughs> class president for four years. Yeah. Uh, but it really, it just had such a, his, his uh, he had such an impact on me in that way. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, um, and I think this is, we're going to return to this, that there are so many interesting experiences that you have, and I like to think that I have, that really shaped who we are, that we didn't get to talk about in the campaign. Yes. We were asked very short, in some cases predictable, and kind of canned questions. And, 30 seconds. Um, 30 seconds, <laughs> one minute. Um, and I think that's unfortunate, and mm -hmm. a little later when we talk about uh, what you're doing today. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts about how the press could help uh, those sides come out. Um, I'd like to transition a little bit, um, and this is uh, too big a question, but with that personal experience and also your deep engagement as in public service and political leadership, how have you seen things evolve uh, on the conversation about race, on the whether we are being honest enough, whether we are uh, still avoiding, and I realize there's huge generalizations here, but I think you and I both felt uh, that we need to have a better conversation. And so what, what has been the trajectory as you've witnessed it? And maybe a little thoughts about where we could go. Well, I, first of all, I want to acknowledge how much progress has been made. Yeah. Um, I think back to my parents and what they went through and the generation before them, my grandfather, who uh, both my, incidentally, Bob, you mentioned I'm a veteran of the Iraq War. My dad is, was a veteran of the Korean conflict. My grandfather served in World War II, Battle of the Bulge. My grandfather came home from that war in a very segregated society. Mm. And, did you know, he did in a seg segregated uh, uh, part of the army. It was still... Uh, it was still segregated. segregated so you've got this African-American coming home, mm. and he's not, my grandfather, not able to access the suburban homes that a lot of the white soldiers are take advantage of some of the benefits all the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Similarly, my father, you know, serves in Korea, uh, puts life on the line of civil rights, but then joins the Navy Reserve mm. when he in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And so, all this to say, I know how much progress has been made. 
um, in the last century, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot more to go. Um, what do I think? I think what's happening right now is, is there is an elevation of conversation about race that we haven't seen mm -hmm. in our country for many decades. I mean, as you and I both know, Bob, we've been on the trail a few times together. Um, the issue of race barely would come up, right? Years ago, decades ago. Um, today, it's a prominent part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, you have presidential candidates embracing the idea of reparations. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was unheard of, mm -hmm. like, you know, eight or nine years ago. So I think that, I think it's a um, good thing that the issue of race is, is actually come up. The question is, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm to your point. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to recognize systemic racism for what it is. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to acknowledge that for uh, since the inception of our country, you've had built-in structures, systemic racism that has produced huge inequity mm -hmm. in wealth, education, mm -hmm. health, and African Americans versus whites. Got to acknowledge that. That's fact. Those are facts. Those are not opinions. Those are facts, right? You also said it was the moral uh, challenge of our times yes. you know, on the campaign trail. So th I did. Yeah. I did. And, and so the second piece of this is mm -hmm. understanding that and embracing those facts. How do we understand perspective, mm -hmm. right? How does an African American, how does a white person understand the experience of a black person now? And how does a black person understand the experience of a white person now? Mm -hmm. um, this is the conversation I think that needs acknowledgement of systemic racism, inequity, certainly from a public policy address it, but how do two human, three human beings, four human beings understand perspective, right? Mm -hmm. That's where I think we need to go. I had a, just a quick, please. I had some incredible discussions uh, at the end of my uh, term as mayor and then during our campaign. Mm -hmm. What I would say, people were shocked at a few things. First, they were shocked that I actually had white Trump supporters that supported me in Newton. There were a portion white of them, Trump correct? Mm -hmm. And people were shocked that I had some white Trump supporters that supported me in my gubernatorial campaign. Mm -hmm. And I would always tell the story, and you've probably heard me tell this story. Don't worry, I've heard all your stories. Going up to, going up okay. to Wichenden, Mass. Yeah, actually I do remember You remember this, this yes, one. Yeah, yeah. And good, good story. I'm not, I won't go through the whole thing, but the takeaway was um, Boston Globe featured Wichenden, Massachusetts as a place that went for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and they went up there and interviewed a whole bunch of people to figure out why. Mm -hmm. They interviewed this guy Jesse and his girlfriend who own uh, a diner there. I read that story and I had been saying we've got to push back against all mm -hmm. the terrible things that Trump says, the isms, but we've got to reach out to his supporters because not all of his supporters are racist, racist, sexist, and all the rest. Right. So I went and visited with Jesse, called him up and I said I wanted to talk to him and sat down and I, and I said, why'd you vote for Trump? Mm -hmm. I don't want to understand that. He said, I went joined the Navy in 1982. You look down the street. People were working at that time. People were having lunch. They were, you know, there were people taking care of their families. He goes, you look down the street today. He said, you see that house? That's an opioid den. Mm -hmm. He said, people have to drive to the next town over, over to buy groceries. And folks that don't have cars have to buy groceries from um, Cumberland Farms right down the street. Mm -hmm. He said, you, you know why, you understand why that uh, I voted for Trump? Because of this. Mm -hmm. And we had a great conversation, Bob, and you and I had similar approaches and concerns about economic inequality, all the rest, and I, I laid out what I wanted to do. At the end of the conversation, he said, I'm with you. <laughs> the end to that story, Bob, yeah. and then I'll, and then I'll yeah. continue. So you allow me to talk here. That's right. I two weeks, water. Two weeks later, toss you can it toss it, it yeah, to me. Right, right. <laughs> two weeks later, I'm in Dudley Square. Yeah. All black, pretty much all black audience. Uh -huh. And... They were, the African Americans and people of color were saying to me, lack of jobs, what are you gonna do about it? Opioid addiction, what are you gonna do about it? On and on and on. So I said to this audience, folks, I was just up in Wichita, Mass. Let me tell you the story of Jesse, and I did. Yeah, yeah. And I said, believe it or not, 
Yes, there's systemic racism. Yes, there's some inequities that are there. But in many ways, we have more in common than we don't. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the perspectives conversation we need to have. I almost, Bob, I, didn't, I never revealed this to you. I came really close to actually pulling together um, a town hall or round table with people from Wichita and Dudley Square. That's a great idea. It's yeah. just, you know, we, we just Get didn't have the capacity. Yeah, right, sure. But that, that's the kind, those are the types of conversations we've got to have. Well, two, two things, things yeah. if I could just, uh, one is that toward the end of the campaign, I, I gave a, you know, really seriously thought out, I hope anyway, uh, uh, speech on race. And one of the things I proposed in it is that we consider having some kind of statewide dialogue on issues of race. Um, in fact, you know, you, you may or may not, I don't remember when I brought this up, but I was talking about if I become governor, I would have invited all our civic institutions mm. uh, to consider having those conversations. Mm -hmm. The other thing I thought is we should consider having some kind of public process uh, similar to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, which had somewhat different focus, but you know, I spent a lot of time in South Africa and I observed the creation of that yes. and its impact. And sometimes bringing those conversations and those stories uh, into, the, uh, into, the, into the public realm is really a, a critical thing. Uh, you were going to add something. I'm I kind of wanted to bring to your experience as mayor, because I think that as mayor, they almost have the most important role in our country today, whereas at a national level, we're so gridlocked and discouraged almost by our inability to push forward in a less ideological and definitely more practical manner, you're able to bring these people together. You, know, you can build relationships with your community. Could you touch on maybe some of the learning lessons you took away from being mayor of Newton, some of the hardships you might have had, and just how you brought the conversation we're having now into the community? And I want to add just a little piece of that. I'm sure that starting at the very beginning, you were like, what is this job? And then over time, you deepened and, and, and got a deeper sense of what Tom's talking about. So give us a little sense also of how you evolved in addressing those questions. Absolutely. I, you know, you're never prepared for a job like that. Yeah, you, you, really well, yeah. don't, you, you really don't have any concept of what it really means to be responsible for a community of you know, close to 90,000 people, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As I like to remind people, when people are in trouble, something happens to them personally, when something happens to their property, something, they don't call their congressperson, they don't call their senator, they don't call their governor, they call their mayor, mm -hmm. the first stop. So um, it, it was the best job I've ever had, mm -hmm. but it was the hardest job I've ever had mm -hmm. and the most rewarding. So what was it like? It was intimidating. When I came in there, you know, we had some pretty serious financial problems in the city of Newton. We had crumbling infrastructure. We had a political system that had been torn apart by override tax battle, high school, and all the rest of it. And I realized how big in the job was in the first couple of months. Um, the key to the success that I had was building a team mm -hmm. that not only had the talent, but had the values. Mm -hmm. I used to remind our employees every single day, you're not, I'm not your boss. The 90,000 people, look at your side, they're your boss. And I used to tell folks, every waking hour, everything you do, whatever we're trying to do, whether it's education, you know, infrastructure, public safety, housing, remind yourself of that every single day. Mm -hmm. So um, it took a while to get to a place, Bob, to your point, where I felt I understood the job. It took a few years, and uh, you know, I, I learned a little lesson with being out with you on the campaign trail a little early there yeah, on our right. first ride, on our first ride, right, okay. on the Senate ride. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that was too early for me to run. Yeah, I shouldn't run that early. Yeah, it taught me a great lesson about um, you know that there was a lot of work to do in Newton, mm -hmm. and and um, so, but. Um, Back to your question. I always also, also used to say, I'm not the mayor of the Democrats, I'm not the mayor of the Republicans, I'm not the mayor of the, I'm mayor of the citizen. 99% mm -hmm. of the time, I had no idea. When I was working with a constituent or solving a problem for the city, I had no idea whether that person was the Republican, Democrat. I think our governance needs to get to outcome-based yes. 
solutions and not rhetorical, not partisan, but outcomes. I built all my budgets based on outcomes. If you go through my eight years of my state of the city, my budget presentations, you will not see the term Democrat or Republican in any of them. Zero. You will see what are the outcomes that need to be delivered to, delivered to move this city forward. So I think our governance at the state level and the national level need to get there as well. That's why I mentioned, I had Trump supporters. I had people that were voted for Trump that, that were supporters of mine and to this day are supporters of mine. Not because of some ideological view I have, because I was doing what was best for my community. I was delivering uh, quality out, uh, outcomes for the city that actually made the quality of life for everyone you better. Said he, I, I have to say, I really support this. I heard you talk about it at town committees, and I don't think people totally understood what you were talking about. I think um, uh, I sort of watched their a little disconnect, and maybe it was the word outcomes, or maybe it was people not really familiar with the concept. But um, uh, just to expand a little bit, this idea that we should have a big goal that we are working towards, yes. uh, that is not really going on in the state. And one of the things that you and I both had concerns about Governor Baker is that he didn't lay out long, I mean, he had very modest, you know, we're gonna increase this 2.6% or look at what I did last year. But this sense that, you know, part of the role of government and leadership is to help set those goals, build those outcomes, and do that also at a national level.